So what happens when, when we go to prayer and we, we bring our petitions, we bring our requests to God, and, and it seems like we wait and we wait and there's no answer? What do we do? It's easy to give up, isn't it? It's easy to get discouraged, especially when you see um, situations like what we've had in recent days here, like with, within Haiti. You see this whole nation and, and the poverty and the and the injustice that, that goes on in this, this island nation and, and all the problems that they've had, corruption that they've had with their leadership. And it, it's just been a mess for years. And so many people living under this kind of turmoil year in and year out and it seems that things never get better. And yet they're the ones that, that have this deadly earthquake and they're the ones that get hit with a tropical storm. And you think, why? Why, God? And we pray for them. We pray for, for salvation. And, you know, there's people who have, have taken a lot of mission trips into Haiti, and we've sent missionaries there, and we've worked with, with the Haitian people. We've set up orphanages and, and uh, food stations. We've tried to teach them how to raise crops. And it, and it just, because of the corruption, nothing seems to change. We see these terrible situation in, in Afghanistan, and, and it's easy to look around in places in Africa and you think, why, God? Why don't you respond? Why don't you bring about change? Um, a lot of information has been going on in the news and our southern border and, and things that are going on there, but there's no question about the reality of sex trafficking, human smuggling that's going on across our southern border. And you hear the stories and you, you, you catch wind of these stories. And I... I've had the privilege to, to talk to people who were involved, like in Wichita, there was sort of a pipeline that came up from Texas all the way to Wichita, Kansas, and on up north, and the officials would find these children and find uh, these people that were really enslaved, and, and just the horrifying stories of, of some of these, these young girls that, that uh, went to a city in Central America because they wanted to go take a job. And, and they were going to make money for their family back home in the village. But what it turned out to be was not a job in the city, but it was a, it was a, a slavery situation where they were captive and, and used as sex slaves. And that goes on right here in the United States. We don't have to go off to the Southeast Asia or some, some far distant pl place. We can see that right here in our, in our own very country. Say, God, why don't you respond? How come you don't answer these kind of prayers? It's easy to get discouraged. And for some of us, we've been praying not just for these kind of tragedies, but we've been praying even for lost loved ones, maybe a spouse that isn't right with God, maybe a sibling that's not right with God. And we've been praying for years and years. And, and you, you, you question, how, God? Why don't you respond? How come they don't see the light? I mean, you know, when you have a, a brother or sister raised in the same home, taught the same things that you were taught, had the same parents that you had, and yet they're far from God, and you say, well, why, God? How come you don't respond and open up their eyes and help them to see? How come they, they can't receive the salvation that, that I've been so blessed with? Well, this passage of Scripture that we read is, is, is certainly talking about prayer, and we were in a series where I've been talking about prayer, and, and I want to highlight that for certain. But in context here, chapter 18 comes before, it comes after chapter 17, right? And you know that, that when Luke wrote out his gospel, he didn't put in the chapters and the verses. We added those things later on. But in context, we see uh, Jesus having a conversation with his disciples and the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were saying, where is this kingdom of God you keep talking about? I don't see this, this kingdom of God that you keep talking about. And Jesus looks at them and says, it's right here in your very midst, and you don't see it. You don't even see it. And, and I could go through a lot of passages to, to talk about the kingdom of God is here. Jesus came to bring us the kingdom of God, and he defeated death, and he defeated sin on the cross, and he rose to new life, and he seated at the right hand of God the Father. And I could tell you uh, from, a, from a theological position 
of how this is the fulfillment of the gospel and how this kingdom of God that Jesus came to initiate here in this world, it starts out like a small little mustard seed, but it grows to be the largest plant where all the birds of the air come and rest, that this kingdom of God is one day going to cover the earth like, like the waters cover the sea, that this kingdom of God starts out small and you might not be able to see it at the very beginning, but one day it will be so evident you can't deny it. And it's hard sometimes for us to believe that because we look around our world and say, where's this kingdom of God at? I have a hard time seeing it. And I think a lot of us have have some faulty understanding of the Bible and faulty understanding of what God wants to do in this world. And we think God's plan for us is to somehow come down, swoop down here and rescue a few of us and steal us out of this, this hell hole that we call earth. When God came to save this earth, this world that we live in, God came to transform this world. And we sing songs like grace greater than our sin. And we believe that that's true for us personally. But we also need to believe that that's true for us corporately and in this world that we live in. That, that God wants to save this world. But it's hard for us. It's hard for us to see it. And we're like, okay, Jesus, where is this so-called kingdom of God? I'm having a hard time seeing it. And Jesus is saying, it's right here in your midst. And then he continues on in chapter 18 to remind us not to give up. And there's three prayers here that we see. In the, and the first one in the story that he tells of chapter 18 is, is about a widow. And he's, he's encouraging us as listeners to, to hear her story and not give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. You, you may feel like tossing in the towel, but Jesus is saying, don't give up. And so this, this woman, as a widow, is, is very vulnerable, of course. She's got no means to, to make income. She's got no one to protect her. And apparently she is being singled out and picked on and being taken advantage of. And so she's got nowhere to go, but she goes to the judge. And the judge is supposed to come and issue justice for her. And she goes to the judge and goes to the judge and goes to the judge, and nothing happens. And it'd be real tempting just to say, I give up. And this, this judge, who's supposed to represent God, is Jesus gives us some indication that he's not a very good person at all. In fact, he's sort of selfish and wicked and lazy himself. And he has no desire to respond to the need that this woman has. And, and so this judge, finally, because he's afraid, this woman's just wearing him out. And so he responds because, and it's kind of funny what, what, what Jesus says in this story. In verse 5, yet this widow keeps bothering me. I'm going to see that she gets justice so she eventually won't come and attack me. She's wearing me out. And, and in the Greek, it literally says she's going to go punch me below the eye. She's going to give me a black eye. She's going to get so frustrated, she's going to attack me. And so I'm going to give her justice because I'm just tired of dealing with her. Jesus is kind of funny in how he tells these stories to, to provide such incredible contrast and such vivid imagery for us to understand what he's getting at and the point that he wants to make is in contrast to this lazy wicked godless judge stands the god of all the universe who is good good faithful righteous just and he's merciful and don't you think that when we go to a merciful good righteous gracious god that he's going to hear us and respond to us and so we know that that is true. But we want to ask, where is it? Where is it at? I don't see it. And we're tempted to give up, aren't we? We're tempted to toss in the towel and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe it just isn't going to happen. And I'll just wait till I get to heaven. I'll stop even trying. I'll just give up and, and wait till I get to heaven. 
And that's why I think we have verse 8 and, and what Hal highlighted that I would highlight here as well. Will Jesus find faith on the earth? Or will he find us as people who have just given up and tossed in the towel and, and we're just coasting our way to heaven? Or will he find people who are earnestly seeking after God and the things of God? And because of our faith and we believe in who God is, we are keeping on seeking and we're keeping on asking and we're keeping on knocking and we're not going to give up and we're not going to lose our faith even though we don't see it with our very eyes. Where is the kingdom of God? It's right here in our midst. It's right here in our midst. Even though we don't see it in its consummation now, and there's a good chance we're not going to see it in our lifetime. But we walk and live by faith, don't we? And so when, when the judge comes, when Jesus comes, will he find any faith among us? Or will he find people who've just given up? And so Jesus tells us this parable to remind us, don't give up. And he talks about this quick judgment and, and I think, again, we, we have to read that in context of chapter 17, where, where Jesus is talking about, you know, how judgment comes and the kingdoms comes. And, and so he uses an example of lightning. You know, I'm, I like to play around with, with my camera. And, and, and one of the things I like to do is try to take pictures of lightning because it's kind of cool to see it all lit up. And so you're standing out there with your cam and you're looking and, and the lightning goes over there and oh, I missed it. So I'm looking over here, and then it comes over here, and I miss it again, you know. It, it, it happens, and it comes fast, and, and you've got to be ready. And, and honestly, you about, you about take photographs of lightning on accident. I mean, that's about how it works. Because it comes so quick, and it's here and gone, and you don't have time to react. And Jesus says, judgment's going to come like that. It seems like it's going on and on for a long time, but when it comes, it's going to come like that. And he uses the, the story of Noah. And, and we remember Noah. God told Noah to build this ark, and it takes him 100 years to build this ark. And he begins to preach and, and preach repentance. And you guys, here comes the, the judgment's coming. Get ready. You better be ready. Better turn to God. And nobody wants to listen to Noah. And he preaches and preaches and preaches, and nobody listens to him. For years he preaches. And nobody responds. But judgment does come, doesn't it? And it comes quick. And the people weren't ready. And, and Jesus is reminding us, don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop walking by faith. Because we need to be ready. Because when it comes, it'll come quickly. Well, then the second person who we find praying is is the religious leader who goes to the temple to pray. And, and I think probably most of the people who were listening to Jesus speak, most of them probably felt pretty good about themselves, about their faith in God. And, and, and again, this is, this is a parable about prayer and, and the prayer of, of two different people, and Jesus contrasts them together. But prayer is, is vitally important because prayer and the way that we pray reveals to us who our God is. And, and the way that we pray and the way that we don't give up and the way that we persevere reveals to us what we think about who God is. And A.W. Tozer said it this way, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Like, preacher, come on. I mean, these preachers are good at overstating things, right? And is that what Tozer's doing here? I don't think he is. What we think of God is the most important thing about us. And he goes on, he says, Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most pretentious fact about any man is not what he, is, what he at a given time may say or do, but what he is in his deep heart conceives God to be like. So who do we think of God? Do we see God... And we started this sermon series talking about God, our Father. Who is our God that we go and pray to? Our Father who loves us. Our Father who is holy. It's important that we understand who God is when we go to him in prayer. 
And so going to the temple, the place where you make sacrifices, the place where you offer up your prayers, this is really important, the Pharisee and the tax collector. But it's also important for us to understand because we're, those of us who are in the church, we hear those words all the time, Pharisee, tax collector, Pharisee, tax collector. And we don't get, the Pharisee would be somebody we would love to have at Hernando Church of the Nazarene. The Pharisee would be a wonderful church person. They would be here on work day. They would be volunteering to teach Sunday school. They would be tithing. They, they, I mean, this would be the kind of person you would love to have. We'd love to have a whole room full of Pharisees because they would be great churchmen. But the Pharisee comes, the religious leader comes, the one who's respected in the community, respected in the church. He comes and he offers up his prayer. And he, and he begins to pray. I thank God. Thank you, God. That sounds good, doesn't it? Thanking God, that's a good prayer. But he's thanking God that for all the things that he doesn't do. I thank God that I'm not a thief. All right, great. I thank God that I'm not a murderer. I thank God that I'm not a member of the Mexican drug cartel. I mean... Okay, big deal, right? So what's your point here? It sounds religious, though, doesn't it? It sounds really holy, but it's really not all that exciting. I thank God that I don't do these things. And, and then verse 12, he, he moves on to the things that he does do, how he exceeds the law. You know, I'm required to fast, but I fast twice a week. I'm that kind of person. And I don't tithe just on some of my, but I tithe on everything, absolutely everything. Can I get an amen from the treasurer? Okay, yeah. I told her this is, this is the kind of person we'd love to have in our church. And then he begins to compare himself with the others around him and that old tax collector over there. Do you think God's impressed with this Pharisee? I don't think he's too impressed, but, but you see how easy it is for the Pharisee to, to think and operate the way that he thinks. I mean, when we, when we hear the word tax collector and we think of somebody who's a tax collector, we need to think of somebody who is vile and evil and rotten because in, in that day, I mean, nobody likes a tax collector, I don't think, around here. Even we, we're not too fond of tax collectors, Right? Nobody wants to go deal with the IRS. Nobody wants to be called into the IRS agency and have to pull out paperwork and document and all that sort of thing. We don't, we're not real fond of tax collectors. But in Jesus' day, the tax collector was the enemy. The enemy because they, they betrayed their people to, to join up with the enemy, with the Romans who were there occupying them, or, or they, they joined up with King Herod who was corrupt and wicked and evil. And so no matter wherever you see a tax collector for Herod or for the Romans, they're evil and they're wicked and they're part of that regime. And so, so think of somebody who's a child molester. And, and, and we, we look down our noses at people like that and say, oh, thank God I'm not one of those, Right? Thank God I'm not a member of the Mexican drug cartel. Thank God I'm not smuggling little girls from Central America to be used as prostitutes, as sex slaves. Thank God I'm not like that person over there in the corner. And the religious person here, the Pharisee here, has lost sight of God. He's lost sight of where he's at. He comes to the temple to worship God, to offer his prayers to God, but, but he's lost sight of that, and his focus is not on holy God. His focus is on everybody else. Dwayne Sipper over here. I'm as good as Dwayne. I'm, in fact, I'm probably a little better than Dwayne. <laughs> Charles Tutterman? <laughs> I'm, I'm as good as Charles. I'm probably better than Charles, too. But you see, when I stand before God on Judgment Day... God's not going to have me stand in judgment with Charles Tutterman or Robert Croft or Dwayne Sipper. God's going to have me stand up on judgment day with his holy standard, with the holy standard of a holy God. 
That's, that's the measuring stick that I'm going to have, that you're going to have, that we're all going to have as we come before God on Judgment Day. It's the holiness of God. It's not, am I better than everybody else? And so the, the religious leader here, the Pharisee here, he has got his sight on everybody else, and he thinks, yeah, I'm pretty good, doing all right here. He drove in his car on the parking lot, and, and he was feeling pretty good, and yeah, the sermon was, yeah, it's okay, and um, out the door we go, let's go beat the Baptist to the restaurant, right? Imagine going to the doctor, and you arrive at the office, and you have to wait, of course, in the waiting room, but you finally get in to see the doctor, and, 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 and the doctor says, well, what can I do for you? And you tell him, well, you can't do anything for me. Let me tell you who I am. I'm doing so good. I'm exercising every day. I'm eating right. Uh, my, my, I've lost weight that you told me to lose. I'm just right. I'm doing everything perfect. I'm, I'm the you know, picture of health here. There's nothing you can do for me. I've got it all together. And the doctor's like, okay, so why did you come here again? Well, I thought you wanted to hear how good I was, how healthy I am. I thought you'd, you'd like to be encouraged by that. And some of us do that when we come to God. When we gather for worship, we, we're, we come with this mentality, with this attitude of, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm a lot better than old Robert Croft, and I'm a lot better than Dwayne Zipper. And look at me, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, right? And God says, well, how about up to my holy standard? How are you doing there? And so then we see this contrast, this, this radical contrast that, that Jesus makes. Um, we have the, the tax collector we have the sinner who recognizes his unworthiness and he doesn't even assume the biblical posture prayer of looking up to God. He can just keep his head low is all that he can do and beat on his chest. And he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or again, in, in, the, in the original Greek, it says, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. The sinner. So I don't know if he thinks of himself as I'm the only one here. Everybody else here is righteous and holy and good, but here's me. I'm not worthy. The tax collector recognizes his, his need for God, his need for the mercy of God. He remembers where he is. He's in the, in the dwelling place of God. And all he can do is humble himself in the very presence of God. In St. Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh, Scotland, there's a painting titled The Presence Alfred Borthwick painted. I don't know if you can see. It's, it's difficult to see, I think, probably on the screen. But this painting, if you can see at the front of the church, are people gathered around for communion, for the Lord's Supper. And the congregation's gathered around front, and we talk about the real presence of God is there among us when we, when we break bread and, and share together in communion. But here in this painting, in the back of the sanctuary, is a man dressed in black, and all we can kind of see is his face, and he's kneeling down at a chair, the furthest chair away. And there's Jesus, ready to reach out and touch him. Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7, as he passed in front of Moses, this is the, the God who's going to pass in front of the of Moses and he proclaims the Lord the Lord the compassionate and gracious God slow to anger abounding in love faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness rebellion and sin yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished he punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation Psalm 103 verses 7 through 12 he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and grace, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as, as our sin deserves or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The tax collector Come seeking God, come seeking the Father, come seeking the one who is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love. And he recognizes his need of God. He recognizes his, his condition and his need for the mercy of God. 
And so Jesus concludes his parable with this verdict that his sins have been forgiven, that he goes home just and justified before God, but also all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This was a shock. How could this tax collector go home justified? How could he go home forgiven? This doesn't make any sense. He's a, a, a dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinner. But this is what Jesus says. Jesus says this man didn't go home feeling better about himself because he got a few things off his chest. Jesus says he went home justified because he found the forgiveness and the healing of God. The religious leader, by contrast, the Pharisee, he trusts in his own good works, he trusts in his own righteousness, and there's no confession of sin. And the religious leader, we're, we're told he doesn't go home justified. Why? He doesn't need it, right? Because he's already arrived in his mind, but he's lost track of his position in the presence of a holy God. We need to be careful also not to assume that the tax collector didn't also have a life that was radically changed and transformed. As we read through Luke's gospel, we see over and over again how this radical transformation takes place. In chapter 5 of Luke's gospel, we'll see a story of another tax collector by the name of Matthew. And you know, he had this encounter with, with Jesus, and his life was transformed and changed because he came into the very presence of the living God. And he was so excited about this, he invited all his tax collector friends, all his sinner buddies, and he invited them to have a party and have Jesus to come and have an encounter with them just like he had with Jesus himself. And so his life was transformed and changed. And we see in chapter 7, it's again the tax collector who agrees with the words of Jesus because they've been baptized with the baptism of repentance, John the Baptist's baptism. And in chapter 15, the Pharisees and the tax collectors were gathered around Jesus, and the Pharisees mutter against Jesus, this man eats with sinners and tax collectors. Doesn't he know? He calls himself a rabbi, and look at him. Look at the kind of people that he's associating himself with. And Jesus says, what? He loves, he loves these repentant tax collectors who come into his presence. In chapter 18 that we read, we have the story of this tax collector, maybe um, one of the most famous tax collectors in chapter 19. Follows up this chapter, the story of Zacchaeus, right? This, this evil, wicked tax collector, everybody knows him, everybody knows his reputation, and he has this encounter with Jesus. And his life is radically transformed and changed. And that's what happens when people are genuinely saved and genuinely justified and genuinely find new birth and salvation. Their life is radically changed and transformed. They go home justified before God and they go home living differently, radically differently because God has come to take up residence in their heart and he has given them new life and the kingdom of God is within them. And they are living in the kingdom of God. And so we see here the power of repentance that's on display. We see the power of the gospel on display. We see the power of grace on display. The power of sanctifying grace on display in the story of how God works with, with these people. The sinners, the vile, the tax collectors. Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11. Son of man, say to the Israelites... This is what you are saying. Our offenses and sin weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? This is the heart of God. The heart of God is that people would, would come and turn, that they would, they would humble themselves, that they would be like this tax collector who, who recognizes his need of God. Lord God, have mercy on me, a sinner, the sinner. Okay, so what does this sermon mean for us? We see here three different prayers, and I'm giving you an opportunity to maybe identify with one of these three prayers. In the first prayer, we have the, the suffering widow. 
not necessarily by sin of her own, but because of the result of sin and injustice going in her life, she is praying and she is seeking God. And maybe some of you are, find yourself in that situation. Maybe it's a health situation that you're dealing with, that you're suffering from pain. Jesus is saying to you today, don't give up. Don't lose your faith. Continue to seek after God. Continue to, to seek after him because he, he hears you and he will respond with justice. There is coming a day when he will make things right. And we will be dwelling with God forever and ever in a place where there'll be no more sin and no more suffering and no more pain. And it will be a wonderful, beautiful, good place to be. The dwelling place of God is with man. So Jesus is saying to you today, don't lose your faith. Don't lose your, don't, don't become embittered. Don't become angry with God. Don't become jealous over what somebody else has. But hold on to the promises of God. Secondly, we see a prayer of the Pharisee who's got his life together pretty well. Who, who walked into church and I've got, I've got things pretty well together. I'm a, I'm a pretty, the pastor, he, he ought to be happy to have me as part of his congregation. What a blessing, my, blessing I am to him and a blessing I am to everybody else around that they can see me and how good I am. I drove past those, those homeless folks out there. Who knows what, what caused them to be in that situation, but, but I'm not like them. I've not had that kind of sin in my life and that kind of trouble in my life because I have followed God. And if that's you today, maybe you need a fresh vision of the holy God. Maybe you need a fresh encounter with the living God who is holy, holy, holy. And maybe, maybe you need to hear him speak to you. Maybe you need to be silent for just a moment and let him speak to you and point out in your heart, in your life, an area that isn't right with God, that doesn't match up with his holiness. Maybe you look good and maybe you cover yourself up pretty well, but God sees and God knows your heart. He knows your pride and your self-justification. And maybe, maybe he's wanting to talk to you about a hidden habit or an addiction or maybe how you speak to your spouse or, or to your children. Or maybe the, the anger or bitterness that you hold and you cover it up with a Sunday morning smile. But deep down, it's hurting. And you know it's there if you allow God to speak to you. You need to embrace the God who is slow to anger, who is compassionate and loving. You need to embrace him. He's not wanting to beat us down, but he's wanting to restore us and to make us justified before him. And finally, the third prayer is that of the tax collector. You recognize, maybe you've walked in the doors even today, and you recognize, my life's not what it ought to be. I need to be in church. I need to be seeking God somehow, some way, some shape or form. You know, I need the mercy of God. If that's you today, you're among friends. Because all of us, all of us need the mercy of God. All of us have been there and are there today. All of us. So we welcome you to the, to the fellowship of those who seek the mercy and the grace of God. And I invite you today to pray the prayer of the tax collector. God, have mercy on me, the sinner. May we all be able to pray that prayer. Um, I wonder if Nancy would come, if she would come and just uh, play a song and give us an opportunity just to, to pause for a moment before we're dismissed. Before we're dismissed, just remind ourselves where we're at. We've come in... 
not to the temple in Jerusalem, but we come into the, the meeting place of God. Holy God, who is holy, holy, holy. And maybe God's been speaking to you as we've been reading the scripture and talking here this morning. Maybe God's been speaking to you, maybe even this last week, about something in particular in your heart and your life that you know it isn't right. Now's the time to seek the mercy of God. There's no sense in going home unjustified. Come and find the mercy of God. Come and find the forgiveness of God. Come and let God justify you. You don't have to, you don't have to make a case for yourself. Let him be the one to exalt you and lift you up. Let's just pause for a moment and, and bow our heads. If you'd like someone to, to pray with you, come forward. You can come and kneel here at the front or come and sit at the front row. Maybe God's speaking to you about a particular need in your heart and your life. And you'd just like somebody to join you in prayer as you call out to God. One's responded already. Is there anyone else? to fool other people but we're not going to fool God
stand together and and maybe we could sing one one verse of that and, and Pastor Josh is gonna lead us in in a, a dismissal and benediction here but let's sing that that chorus that, that Nancy was singing standing on holy ground as we as we wrap things up here today. We are standing. Are you aware of your need for God? Whether or not we go about the awareness of it every day of our lives, we owe everything we are to the God who created us, sustains us, and desires to restore us along with everything. So may the God who did just that, created, sustains, and restores, give you the eyes to see yourself in need of him and to see him with arms open wide to meet the needs of you and to meet the needs of the world through you, send you in the grace of Christ and with the presence of the Holy Spirit to do his work. Amen. Thank you.